A lot of you have been asking us to review the Carly Audio LP8 monitors. After months of waiting for stock, they finally arrived and we were able to put them through their paces, excited to hear them in our own studio after all the hype they've been receiving online. According to Carly, these are the best monitors you can buy for under $500. That's about £370 in the UK. But is it true? First, let's jump in and take a quick look at the specs. This is the second wave of LP8s, and the first thing that's the most noticeable over the original is that it has a 12 decibel reduction in self noise. This is due to a new amplifier platform that also offers improved DSP for a smoother high end, and the new matte finish woofer promises a faster transient response and a large diameter voice coil for lower distortion. A single LP8 comes in at 41.9 centimeters high, 25.4 wide, and 28.6 deep, and weighs nine kilograms. This is a two-way speaker system with an eight inch woofer and a one inch tweeter crossing over at 1,800 Hertz. The bass driver performs all the way down to 37 Hertz. However, its roll off begins at 45 Hertz, but that's still a pretty decent amount for a small near field monitor. The drivers are bi-amped and powered by a Class D amplifier pushing a peak SPL of 117 decibels. So these go plenty loud enough for most small to medium sized rooms. Inputs are thoughtfully provided on balanced XLR, quarter inch TRS jack and RCA. So that's pretty much all the options covered for easy hookup to any decent audio interface or monitor controller. As with the first generation of LP series, there are some dip switches on the rear panel to aid in tweaking the frequency response, depending on how the monitors are positioned in the room. And Carly have once again given us some excellent graphical representations of most typical monitoring setups, and we found these to align very well with the various options we tried when testing these monitors in various positions. Of course, rooms do vary wildly, so if you find the monitors lacking in top end or boomy in the low end, you can experiment with these settings to find one that best suits your room. So how do they sound? In the mid-range, I could hear a general boxiness that was quite hard to ignore at first, although after having spent a few weeks listening to and working on these, one of two things has happened. I've either got used to it, or the speakers have burned in. I'm not sure which, but either way, it's no longer as noticeable as it was when I listened to them for the first time. Mid-frequency detail is acceptable at the price. However, when listening to music featuring acoustic guitars or a real piano, or indeed any exposed instrument with strong mid-range transients as a fundamental part of that sound, I feel myself wishing that there was slightly more three to four kilohertz transient information to really bring out that detail. The low end detail is excellent with the front port really working well to eliminate most of the problems often heard with front ports with no noticeable chuffing or turbulence apparent. But I did find it quite easy to drive the speakers up to a volume at which it sounded like a particularly aggressive sounding limiter was kicking in, not pleasant. But going back to the mid range and particularly the low mids, am I hearing a similar issue to that in the Adam T8V we reviewed a few months ago? Decent drivers let down by a lack of damping of the thin MDF box and plastic front panel. Mark? Regular viewers will know that the first thing I like to do after giving a new set of monitors an extensive listening test is to note what I'm hearing that I don't like and then take them to pieces and see what can be improved. In the case of the PSI A17M, which are a much smaller two-way near field and come in at around £3,000 in the UK, it was nothing at all. But with the Callies, I'm hearing the same box in as James's, despite what the ruler flat frequency response graphs on Callies website tell me. And this is why we need to largely ignore manufacturer's frequency response graphs. On paper, you could be led to believe that you're going to get a very similar sound to the A17. But in reality, there's so much more to the sound of a speaker than its frequency response curve and the A17s sound enormous and incredibly detailed compared to the LP8s as they should for the price. On removing the back panel of the LP8, we see a typically underwhelming Class D amplifier assembly alongside a cheap but functional power supply. What really strikes me though on first glance in the back of the cabinets is the rather chunky motor assembly on the bass driver. This is also vented and certainly goes at least part way to explain the great bass response of the LP8. However, I was disappointed to find absolutely no internal cabinet bracing, and we see a similar volume of acoustic wadding as found in the Adam T8V, albeit positioned slightly differently. 
On taking the front baffle off and removing the drivers, no mean feat due to the need for finding a very long screwdriver in order to negotiate the base port, I found a similar issue to pretty much any budget near-field monitor in this price range. A cheap as chips plastic front baffle that seems to be resonant at around the frequencies at which we were hearing the boxiness. With the Adam T8V, we filled the front panels with cement and achieved a much better monitor for very little additional financial outlay, but a messy load of effort. So we dived into the comments to see what our viewers suggested, and most suggested the kind of self-adhesive heavy acoustic damping material as popular with the in-car audio fraternity. So onto Amazon I went, and the next day set about lining and therefore adding mass to that plastic front panel. Whilst I was at it, I could also hear some clear resonance in the standard thin MDF box you get with a speaker at this kind of price. Now, whilst my knowledge of speaker design is merely good enough to just be dangerous, experience has taught me that generally, the more inert a cabinet is, the better. And as we had more than enough damping material to treat both cabinets, I was interested to hear what difference this would make. So you can't really hear much of a difference on the video, to be honest, but in the room, it's quite noticeable. A lot of the boxiness we were hearing has been significantly reduced, and in the modified speaker, we're hearing a significant amount of detail, especially in the low mids at around three to 400 hertz, exactly where that boxiness was. There's an intentional nasty distortion in the base of the track we played, and we can hear that much more clearly in the modified speaker than we can in the stock one, and that's exactly what you want from a studio monitor. We've also added a kilogram or so of weight to the modified speaker and that means it sits more firmly on a speaker stand or on isolation mounts on a desk. So for the moderately DIY savvy, I think it's a modification that's worth doing. But as they come out of the box, what do we think of the LP8? There has been a huge amount of hype around the Carly series of monitors, with most reviewers, on YouTube particularly, seeming to suggest that here is a company offering much more than the competition in terms of quality for around the same price, even to the point of less money being spent on packaging so that more money can be spent on the product. But whilst we were impressed with the build quality and particularly the size of magnet on the base driver, at the end of the day, for a shade under £400 a pair in the UK, you get some cheap drivers in a thin MDF box with a plastic front panel, pretty much what you should expect and pretty much what every other manufacturer is offering at this price point. We were disappointed with the lack of bracing in the cabinet, something that Adam Audio seemed to have done a much better job with in the T-Series, but the sound differences between the two are largely down to personal taste and practical considerations. The LP8 could be a better proposition with its front firing port if you need to have the speakers pushed back against a wall or into a corner, but the T8V, for us, offers a slightly better and more revealing top end with its air motion transformer tweeter, something many people don't like. It's horses for courses and further proof that you should really try to get to a dealer and audition any monitors before you buy them. But to answer the question in the thumbnail of this video, is the Kali LP8 the best near field monitor of its type or is it marketing hype? Should you sell your existing comparable monitors and rush out and buy a pair of these? In a word, no. 
It's an excellent monitor for the money and there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do a good mix on one of these, but we really don't feel it offers any particular technical advantage over the competition. It's a great monitor and there are lots of great monitors on the market in this price range these days, so try before you buy it and if you can't, pick one you like the aesthetics of and get to know it really well. Listen to plenty of reference tracks that you know really well, reference your mixes in as many different environments as possible, including headphones, and remember, no monitor will make your music better. So make sure you've got that down before anything else. <laughs> Much too dangerous to play the single.